webinar session today. Um, I'm just going to let everyone join um, and just give it a minute or two. Um, but I'm joined by Kerry Belber today. Um, Kerry is going to, well, I've seen her presentation. She's going to be giving us a really interesting presentation on um, understanding and treating rosacea. Um, Kerry is a laser trainer and clinic director of Laser Skin Solutions, which is a um, clinic that specializes in laser based in Bournemouth. Um, so hi, Kerry. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, Georgia. It's so nice to be here. I've been really excited about today. Yeah, I think it's going to be really good. Um, it is. Like oh. I said to you before, Kerry, I think our sessions on specific um, skin conditions and dealing with them and how to treat them have been really popular. So hopefully, um, I'm sure this one will be the same. So think perhaps a few more people um, are just joining but Kerry do you want to maybe just start as people are still joining just give us a kind of brief introduction to what um, the webinar is going to be about today specifically. Yeah so so basically I've been treating rosacea for about 15 years. Um, I absolutely love treating the condition um, you know like like with other uh, skin conditions I treat in clinic like acne it's it's a very which is Part of what I'm going to be covering in this in this uh, webinar is that it is actually nothing to do with acne, but just like other skin conditions like acne, you know, it's really important how you approach treatment. Um, so basically, I've put together today a little webinar about you know what the condition is, um, the different sort of stages, subtypes, how to approach it, uh, what works, what doesn't, and then at the end, I've also put some pictures of clients of mine who sort of come in presenting certain types. Uh, of rosacea um, with a quick sort of would you treat would you not treat and how I would basically approach it so yes yeah, so it should be really interesting really good fun I'm going to try and be conscious of time because the thing is as I was looking at this last night you know each thing could be a webinar in itself whether we're talking yeah. about peels or laser or whatever so I am going to be conscious of time because we want to allow sort of questions at the end so yeah. Um, but yeah it should be it should be really good Fab, okay, and speaking of questions, um, if anyone does have any questions for Kerry, if you just wanna pop them in the chat box and what we'll do is at the end of the presentation, um, I will, I'm gonna turn my camera off and I'll come back on at the end and then we'll have a little Q&A session and I'll pass on your questions to Kerry. So I'm going to start sharing my screen. Um, and I think we'll get going. Also, if anyone has any issues with sound, um, just drop something into the chat box and we'll try and get that sorted. Um, okay. <clears throat> so, Kerry, if you're ready, we can um, we can get started. I will turn my camera off. Mm -hmm. And then you just, you just give me um, a little nudge when you want me to change the slides over. Yeah, lovely, thank you. <laughs> so. Yes, yeah, so my name is Kerry and I am the clinic director at Laser Skin Solutions of Bournemouth. Um, so I've been uh, dealing with various skin conditions and um, laser treatments for about 15 years and I'm also a laser trainer. So in my time I have trained doctors, dermatologists, um, clinicians, basically anyone who uh, deals with medical grade uh, lasers. That's just a little bit about my background. But rosacea is something I'm particularly passionate about um, because of the effects that good treatment and the right approach to treatment can sort of have on this condition and therefore basically people's lives. So um, if we just go on to the first um, uh, screen, so the next one, um, thank you, Georgia. <laughs> it's quite nice not having to worry about the tech side of things today. So basically, as I'm sure you probably all know, and I'm, I know we'll have a complete mix of people watching this today, but rosacea is basically a progressive inflammatory vascular disorder. And it is characterized by um, some distinct stages, not for everyone, again, I'll get onto this later on the webinar, but also some subtypes. It's typically characterized by flushing and blushing, um, mainly on the face, uh, but not only on the face. Um, and it tends to affect lighter skin types. Um, it is actually possible for black skins to get rosacea. It's not very common, um, but it tends to affect sort of, you know, Northern European sort of white, uh, lighter Caucasian skin types. It is definitely more common in women, but unfortunately when men get it, they, they, they tend to get it worse. Um, so, um, so the one thing I would say is if 
I would love what I would love for anyone watching this today to take away more than anything else is that there is no single approach to treating rosacea um, and not everyone is going to be presenting in the same way and therefore you know even if you are a laser clinic or not or you do uh, skin care um, that there isn't going to be sort of a, a one type uh, fits all. So if we can go on to the next slide. So what the um, so as I said, it, it mainly affects the it mainly affects the sort of the main areas um, of the face. It is sometimes commonly mistaken for acne, which I am going to go on to. Um, one of my biggest bugbears, as I was saying to Georgia the other day, is when I hear acne hyphen rosacea that there is there is no such thing. Um, but I will go on to that uh, in a bit. But it can present sometimes. You know, people can understandably think they might be getting acne. So I'm going to be going into that a little bit more uh, detail. The cause is unknown. We don't really know why people get rosacea. Um, it can be very hereditary. Um, but we don't actually know how it comes about that people uh, get rosacea exactly. So if we go on to the next um, slide. So different subtypes, as I said in the beginning, um, there are there are definitely subtypes of rosacea. This does not mean, though, that everyone will just fit into one sort of pigeonhole. Uh, they'll either be number one or number two, etc. Um, some people can present with a mix as well. So if we just go through them, but generally speaking, um, people can be affected by different subtypes and therefore um, treatment should be sort of geared towards that. So the first one, it's a bit of a mouthful, it's erythem erythematotelangiectatic rosacea. And that presents as your typical sort of redness. Um, people flush and blush easily. You can normally see vessels um, at, you know, on the surface of the skin. Um, and they can get some incredible sort of burning and, and itching sensations. So when often clients, you know, come, come to me in clinic, uh, they'll often say, you know, I wake up in the morning and it just starts burning and, and itching. And it, you know, it's the, the first thing they're having to deal with in the morning is, is their skin. So that is a very, very popular type um, or common rather than popular uh, type of rosacea. So papular pustula, this basically normally presents with some redness. You can just get the bumps without, but generally speaking, there will be redness as well. Um, and this is the one that can typically be get confused with acne. Um, it's not acne, um, but um, it can get sometimes get confused because it presents with, so whereas acne vulgaris, so active acne presents with redness and sort of, you know, whiteheads, um, sometimes certain types of sort of, um, you know, pustules that you can get with rosacea can look a little bit like um, uh, acne. So thymatous rosacea, that's often uh, commonly uh, goes hand in hand with rhinophyma. Um, and the symptoms include, I don't know if you've ever seen sort of thickening of the skin, irregular sort of surface of the skin, um, and it affects obviously um, other areas of the face. It can affect not just um, the nose, but sometimes people, you know, when you see them with a sort of large bulbous uh, nose people associate it with you know alcohol or drinking and it's actually not it is it is part of a certain type of rosacea so ocular rosacea believe it or not you it can affect the eyes um, so it's quite often goes hand in hand with dry eye um, and it can affect the eyelids as well um, people often feel like there's something stuck in their eyes um, like you know sort of like a foreign body and you can look and look and there's, there's nothing there um, but um, yeah so it, it is actually uh, another type of, of rosacea it uh, quite often uh, men get ocular rosacea as well and when they do get it it can be it can be quite um severe and a, and a fifth type which is hardly ever talked about and again i mean this can be another entire uh, webinar is neurogenic and that is basically um when you know people can have other things going on basically often neurological or or, psych, or psychological um and as a result uh, they also get um rosacea at the same time so um so that's just kind of like an overview as i say no no one person will ever fit into sort of one particular subtype of rosacea um but it's important to kind of recognize the subtypes because if people are presenting in a certain way that will affect you know how how you treat people so if we go on to the next um, slide. So as I mentioned before, we don't really know the causes. Um, it is very 
often uh, hereditary. So one of the first questions I always ask people is, you know, did your mum have it? Did your did your father have it? And sometimes it can even skip a generation. So, you know, sometimes they, people say, oh, do you know, my grandmother had, you know, really sort of, you know, uh, pink, you know, she never used to complain about it, but I, I always remember her as a child having this very, you know, pink flushed face. So sometimes it can even skip a generation, but we do know that it, it tends to be hereditary, not always, but, but it, very commonly so. So the nature of rosacea is such that it, it um, what happens is, is with your vessels, your, your vascular, your vessels are made up of what's called endothelial tissue, and that's basically muscular tissue. So it enables vessels to dilate and contract back. But the nature of rosacea is such that it actually makes these vessels a bit defunct. And so the elasticity doesn't really work any longer. So vessels dilate very easily. end up looking very sort of red and initially they can be flushing and blushing for you know a few hours and sometimes it becomes a few days and then suddenly before they know it um you know it's it's suddenly they're, they're flushed all the time so um there is a lot of different things going on with rosacea which again is if this is a vast uh, topic but um they're you know, it, it can be as a result of sort of immune uh, cells and inflammatory mediators. So these are like little messenger cells that get literally sent up uh, from the skin up to the surface that can cause the rosacea, especially the papular pustular type. So if we go on to the next uh, slide. Um, so <laughs> I don't know how many of you uh, out there have seen this little lo lovely looking furry friend. Um, so this is called, I call it the Demodex mite. It, it is called the Demodex mite sometimes, but basically this lovely looking attractive creature um, does actually live on our skins, um, all of our skins, um, you know, normally. But in rosacea, um, they have found that this mite can be up to 18 times more than it should be. So we're not actually sure as to whether the mite is causing uh, more of the inflammation and more of the rosacea symptoms or whether rosacea itself is actually providing the ideal sort of almost breeding ground for these mites to go into overdrive. Um, they can be, again, this mite in itself could be another um, entire webinar, but just to know that for some people, um, it can be quite a severe uh, problem. And, but there is actually a solution to it. So you can use something called cilantro, which is ivermectin, which can help get the mite um, under control. Um, but it is definitely something that I always look out for in clinic uh, to rule out first before I would even go near someone with a laser. So if we can go on to the next um, slide. So obviously different types of rosacea will benefit from uh, different types of treatment. So where you get your typical, you know, people often say to me, oh, you know, should, should everyone have laser treatment for rosacea? And the answer is absolutely not. Not everyone should have, not everyone should have anything. I think the most important thing is when people come in, that you're very informed about their conditions so that you can give them um, all the information that's required so that they can actually make an informed decision as to what, what resonates with them and what sounds like, you know, the way forward that they would like to, to go with. So, but in general, when you do see the very sort of, you know, vascular red type of, uh, of rosacea, then in that instance where you can see dilated blood vessels, um, preferably without any pustules, um, then you would apply laser, IPL or even LED um, treatment. And you can also use topical uh, creams. And there is no sort of one answer fits all. Sometimes it could, you know, it requires a combination of approaches. Um, so LED will not get rid of vessels. It doesn't coagulate the blood like a laser treatment would, which I will be going on to, uh, but it can really help with some vasoconstriction. So um, reducing the, the redness. Um, so the papular pustula, so this is the very inflammatory rosacea that often gets mixed up with, with acne. Um, the first thing I do, and there's a really good photograph coming up uh, later of a client who came in. If I see someone who is very, very inflamed um, and they're presenting with, you know, pustules, et cetera, I, I tend to always refer them back to their GP to rule out uh, the, the demodex mite. So they can prescribe, be prescribed something called cilantro. 
And they will very, very quickly become apparent as to whether this mite is really causing not all of the rosacea, but uh, a large, a large part of it. So I think it's just an ethical way of, of operating. You know, I think it's important to rule out other things before you, you go anywhere near someone with the laser. So yeah, so I send them back to their, uh, their doctors um, to see if they can get a prescription. Um, if obviously, if that doesn't work um, and they are still too inflamed to treat uh, with a laser, um, then uh, the option is to also go on to antibiotics. And it's really important here to know that the antibiotic use in this case is not actually because of bacteria, like you would prescribe antibiotics for acne, for example, which is caused by an anaerobic bacteria. This is simply for the anti-inflammatory properties of something like doxycycline, which will help get that inflammation down because the last thing you want to do is be applying any kind of sort of laser treatment uh, to incredibly inflamed skin. That's not the same for LEDs, however. So LED for the, you know, um, infrared or near infrared um, light is actually really beneficial in helping to reduce that inflammation. So sometimes I do a combination of sending back to GPs and getting under someone under an LED. Um, it, it just depends, you know, what's going on for them. And of course their budget as well, which, you know, we have to keep in mind when people are coming through our doors. So on to the next slide. Um, so the, oh, gone one too far, I think. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. It looks like um, one of the slides is missing. Not to worry. So basically going through the other types with ocular rosacea, um, basically I when I have treated people in the past who are presenting with um, sort of the reddening type of rosacea, I have found that by treating the cheek area, even though we don't treat beyond the eye bone, um, basically because the thermocoagulation, so when you're, you're heating vessels here that are coagulating, um, the heat can actually travel up even though we're not treating beyond the eye bone. And I have seen amazing effects on ocular rosacea on the sort of the, the lower eye uh, lid, uh, rim even. And so it can give people relief from ocularization, but obviously when we're dealing with actual eyes, I always refer to an ophthalmologist um, because there's various things that they can do, including even issuing sort of um, steroid uh, drops if necessary. Um, so, you know, there is, there is no cure, and this is something else that I want to impress upon people. You know, there is no cure for rosacea, but there are lots of things you can do to help people manage uh, their condition. So, and if with the, uh, the fifth one, the neurogenic uh, type, then you will probably find that people will already be under a doctor or a consultant if they are, you know, suffering with any other um, health issues, especially psychological. And so really then it comes down to you as a practitioner as to how they're presenting and, you know, whether um, you can actually indeed treat. So, um, so consultation tips. So um, consultations, um, you know, at my clinic, I, I do it a whole hour for consultations. I think it's really important. And also when I'm delivering training, you know, sometimes I, I go into clinics who have already been doing uh, treatments and I find that sometimes they're doing like, you know, 15, 20 minute consultations. This is, this is really important because, you know, sometimes it just takes people longer to open up. Um, they have to feel confident. They have to be, feel relaxed. And quite often people with rosacea, they'll be coming to you as, you know, they're literally tearing their hair out. They've tried everything. They've read up on everything. And so they can be quite stressed when they arrive or even just apprehensive. So it's really important to make them feel really relaxed. And the one thing I would say always with consultations is as a practitioner, you know, you guys out there will, will know that you have a lot of knowledge and you want to obviously, you know, tell people about it. But actually, the most important thing is listening and just allowing that person to just tell you exactly what's going on for them, exactly what's going on for their skin and not just their skin, but their whole bodies, because, you know, um, stress is a massive cause um, of flare ups for rosacea sufferers. And if they're not getting enough sleep, they're not drinking enough water, you know, that's going to cause mechanical stress on the body. So I always really take my time. I actually sometimes book, if it's a skin consultation, we often in clinic book an hour and a quarter just to allow that conversation to flow because it's amazing what you can get, you know, from people once they feel relaxed. So they're going to obviously open up and, and confide in you a lot more and tell you what is really going on for them. So 
Um, the first thing is, is it definitely rosacea? Because there are other skin conditions which can look like rosacea. Um, so um, it's important to take that time and, you know, I have a whole list of questions in clinic and again, consultations um, could, you know, could take another uh, webinar on themselves. But um, whether it is rosacea or whether it is just red vessels, if they are not presenting with a sort of papular pustular type, they, it is just redness. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter in terms of the treatment. If they are laserable, whether they are rosacea or red vessels, that in itself doesn't matter. What does matter is that if it is rosacea, they need to understand that it's not a cure, it's management, not that vessels per se are ever, you know, a cure, are ever cured with laser, but that it is going to be a lifelong condition that they are going to have to manage this. But it, the key thing is about managing client expectations. And, you know, I, I never get any clients who are upset or disappointed with treatment. And this is not because I can do everything 100% of the time, or I can you know, grant them all their wishes or make their skin look exactly how they want. It's because I'm very honest and realistic about, you know, expected treatment outcomes. So that is a, a huge part of the consultation, especially with something like uh, rosacea. So sometimes I do get people who come in and they say, my GP said I have rosacea. And after sitting down with them for a good half hour and talking to them, I actually think, you know what? they don't seem, I don't think it is rosacea. Now I'm not medical, I don't profess to know more than GPs, but I do know enough about rosacea to ask the right questions that then give you the answers to be able to make a good assessment. So for me, if, you know, if someone, you know, if their, any of their parents have it, if they don't get any discomfort, if they don't get any flushing or blushing, you know, triggers or, or episodes and a whole host of other things, then to me, it could just be broken veins. And either way, you know, if that is the case, then then great. They haven't got rosacea and you can you can do a light based treatment on them. Um, but if it is rosacea, then it's really important that they obviously understand, as I say, that it is um, a condition they're going to have to manage. But also, most importantly, is to establish what their triggers are. Now, sometimes I get clients in who say, I have no idea what causes my flare ups. It, you know, it drives me insane. Um, other people will say, gosh, you know, as soon as I go out in the sun or if I have a glass of red wine or if I get you know upset about something or if I'm about to give a speech I will flush and blush and I'll, I'll have a big um, flare-up so then they know if they don't in my clinic I actually send them away with a rosacea diary and you guys can all get a copy of that it's actually from rosacea.org which is uh, an American website uh, which is fantastic I've been sort of one of their on their list since 2005 when I used to get their sort of you know paper newsletters sent all the way from America but now obviously text moved on so you know you could they can email you reg on a regular basis but they have a fantastic diary on their website and it's literally a tick box exercise you know what was the weather like that day what have you eaten you know is it anything spicy because obviously that can be a trigger um, and therefore by the end of it you kind of hopefully can get a picture of what may be causing their flare-ups which they may have not you know realized you know one of my clients years ago we discovered as a result of keeping this diary that um she had an allergy to msg so that's monosodium glutamate which is a, a horrible uh, sort of flavor enhancer which i avoid like the plague it's it's not good for all manner of stuff including eczema psoriasis um so so yeah so by taking the time and really getting people to also take ownership of their own condition because that's another thing when people come in you know i'm very much about listen it's not just a case of you coming in paying x amount i do your treatment and off you go you like as with acne you know i get my clients you have to work with me and if, if you work with me we will get you the best possible results that we can get for you so the rosacea diary is, is a really good tool for that. Uh, and as I say, just managing their expectations and not promising, promising the earth. So the way I operate for all treatments I do in my clinic is I, I under promise and hopefully over deliver. So that's the way I, I tend to like working. So um, moving on. 
Um, so uh, treatment tips. So how many treatments? So again, it really depends, you know, how they're presenting. So if, for example, you know, we've been through uh, the whole consultation with them, you've established that um, they're not going to be referred to a doctor for anything. It is something that you can actually treat in clinic. Um, obviously, we're a laser clinic, so we do mainly our treatments with uh, a combination of peels, LEDs and laser. So if you're in that same category, um, this is how I would approach treatment. So generally, with any vascular treatment, any vascular treatment on the face, whether it's rosacea or not, you need to count on at least three to six treatments. OK, so the amount of laser can be reduced uh, depending on whether you're able to exfoliate the skin uh, or not. Now with um, uh, you know, people with, who have rosacea, their skin tends to be very sensitive, um, obviously, and um, can be very inflamed as well. So if it is inflamed, obviously we need to get that inflammation down and I would use that by, do that by using LEDs. Um, but if they, if it is possible um, uh, to treat them, then, um, it, you know, a lot of people will say, you know, you shouldn't use glycolic on, on um, people with rosacea. Yes and no, it really depends how bad the rosacea is and, um, you know, what the concentration is, et cetera, et cetera. And within peels, there is a vast range of peels. Obviously, we have AHAs and uh, BHAs. And we even now have polyhydroxy acids, which is something that definitely people with rosacea could consider doing, which is much more gentle. So the molecular structure is actually a lot bigger uh, than AHA. So it doesn't penetrate the skin and possibly cause um, irritation. But the thing, the most important thing, obviously, is to always follow, you know, protocols. So if you are dealing with a range of products in clinic that has been you know, tested and they are happy for you to use on, on rosacea, then, then great. But I wouldn't ever try anything you know, that, that isn't, hasn't been okayed for rosacea. So I tend to combine um, with um, peels if they can tolerate it, um, but building them up at first with a low concentration at home. Um, or I, as I say, I get them straight under the LED to get that inflammation down. Once we're able to treat with a laser, as I say, it's three to six um, uh, treatments. And the way it works is we are literally applying um, a laser light and um, it depends whether you're using laser or IPL. I mean, I have 11 different laser types and IPLs um, in clinic, so that do all manner of different things. Um, but with, um, with rosacea, I would um, uh, apply a laser light. And what happens is, is that it's actually the blood that absorbs um, the light, it coagulates and the body carries it away. So it's literally your white blood cells that come along and engulf the, the blood um, and carry it away. So that's why you need to leave about at least three, possibly four weeks um, for uh, the vessels to clear after a treatment, because uh, you need to allow that time for the body to do its clearing up job, basically. Um, and then the person's ready for their next treatment. Um, so I would always go for the most obvious target first. So you want to... So when you're looking at someone's face, it, it will look like they're presenting with a, a certain amount of target and it might look like it's all sort of fairly superficial. But if you were to take a cross section of the skin, you would see that these vessels are all sort of sitting slightly, some more sort of, sort of superficial than others. Um, and so the ones at the top are going to compete. Um, you know, they are going to grab that light first from, from the light, from the laser treatment. And so it's very important that at the very first treatment, if someone is presenting with a lot of target, is to make sure that you go gentle, because obviously all of those vessels are going to be trying to um, absorb that light and that's when you can get unnecessary side effects so it's always I always say to err on the side of caution um, and I think we've we've dealt with dealing with inflammation so moving on um, so so this is a, a photograph um, of someone who came in with rosacea this is after one treatment so you can see that's a really nice nice result the only thing I would say is that it's quite a high fluence to start on. So it's not someone I treated, the photos coming up are of my clients, but I wanted to add this in today to just to show you what one treatment can do 
at a high energy. Obviously, you need to be, you know, quite experienced to, to be able to, to do this and have the right skin type as well. Um, but I would always err on the side of caution. So she did get a lovely result, um, but 30 joules is, is quite high. Um, but she was fine and she got great results. So that, that's great. So moving on to the next um, slide. So this is a client of mine. So, um, so basically, I don't remember you mentioning about people uh, coming in and saying, my doctor says I have rosacea. So this is a classic example of a lady I treated, as you can see from the label, back in uh, 2006. So it was 29th of September 2006. So um, she came in. Uh, she was adamant she had rosacea because her doctor had said so and after sitting down with her and going through a consultation and all of the questions that I've sort of mentioned um, she didn't have rosacea she didn't get any of the discomfort the flushing the blushing uh, neither of her parents had it um, she was just very outdoorsy she had horses um, and she spent her life out time outside she was in her late 40s um, and had never worn sunscreen so this was environmental basically um, so but she got fantastic results so this was just after four treatments um, so as a practitioner, obviously, <laughs> I would love to have been able to do a fifth one on her just to mop up the few that were left, but she was happy. And that's where I stop in my clinic. You know, once clients are happy, then, you know, I'm happy to stop treatments. But yeah, with one more, we could have literally mopped up just a, a few more but she got a fantastic result and she used to say you know she used to spend her life uh you know buying concealer and because because of the heat that these vessels cause your concealer never really stays on very well so she was absolutely delighted but this is just to show you that you know if people come in she could have easily had rosacea you can't tell by looking you know that's why it's so critical to to have that long conversation with people um because so yeah but it didn't matter at the end and I actually phoned her about a year ago obviously I didn't haven't seen her since 2007 and her vessels have hardly come back obviously she's now wearing sunscreen so that's great <laughs> anyone who knows me and if any friends are watching know that I'm a complete geek when it comes to sunscreen my partner literally when we go on holiday he he hates me because I have no issues with walking up to people on the beach and saying oh, excuse me I, I think you're burning uh, which he hates but I can't I can't bear see, seeing skin burn so the one thing I always say to people which is a, for me is a non-negotiable when you're talking about rosacea is applying sunscreen because it is a is a big trigger for for people so on to the <clears throat> next slide Oh, so there's quite a few slides missing from this. I think this is the... Harry, let me just go in and let me just check if we've got the right one up, hold on. Okay, that's all right. One second. Hold on, let me go. Okay, so what, what George is just um, saying, I actually updated because I was very conscious of, of time. So normally when I do, I've been doing sort of uh, national webinars recently and uh, they tend to be about an hour. So when I realized this was gonna be a bit shorter to allow sort of more time for questions, um, I took a load of slides out. And then last night, poor George, I added a load of slides in. So, um, mm -hmm. because it was just to be able to show you guys, you know, the different types of rosacea that can come through the door, you know, what to do with them um, uh, in terms of, you know, uh, approaching uh, treatment. Um, so, because that's the thing, you know, no one person will ever present in the same way when you've got rosacea clients coming through the door. Um, and that's why it's important to take a holistic um, approach. So, and I think if you do, oh, lovely. <laughs> Sorry, that's my fault, everyone. Is that, <laughs> that's what we need to be, isn't it, there? Yes, yeah, that's, that's perfect. That's all right. Um, so yeah, so that's why, as I was saying, you know, it's it's really important to uh, to take that approach because I think, you know, if somebody uh, comes through the door and they even get a sense of, well, this is how we treat rosacea, you just do this, then they're probably going to feel like you're not understanding them. You know, rosacea is a very personal thing to people who, who have this condition. 
Um, and it's really critical that they feel that um, they are not only feel that they're getting a treatment tailored to them, but, but that is just the right way to do it as well. So, so I thought it'd be um, quite um, helpful and interesting to have some uh, pictures of people uh, who may come through your door and just to have a discussion about whether to treat or not to treat. So for me, if someone came through the door like this, as she did, this is one of my clients. Um, absolutely. So she definitely had rosacea um, and not just on her face, but it actually went round the side of her jawline as well. So it wasn't papular pustular. So she wasn't getting any of the inflammation in terms of like the type of pustules and spots you can get. Um, she literally just had the redness. So she was an absolutely ideal candidate uh, for this. And she did get fantastic results. And that is on another slide, which I'll show you in a second. So yes, yeah, so when you get someone like this, you're going to be talking yes you can combine with with peels depending on if it's AHA, BHA or or polyhydroxy acids um, and then you want to combine it with some laser treatment and as it happens once we got rid of the redness she was then able to have a course of glycolic peels and LED just for general skin rejuvenation so she was she was really chuffed to bits and she was lovely to treat as well. So um, on to the next um, slide. So there she is. So this is before, I'm sorry, it looks a little bit blurred, but that might be my internet. So the after photo, um, the, the difference is staggering. I mean, I always take my photographs under the same light. So I have a, a magna lamp, um, a mag lamp even, um, in clinic that um, has something that mimics daylight. So the photographs are always taken uh, on under the same light and you can see that the results are just amazing so she was really chuffed a bit now she knows full well so she's actually had a lot of relief from this for a while but she's managing her condition as well by doing other things herself and she does still get flushing but because we've got rid of the defunct vessels that stay dilated when she does flush she um, just doesn't suffer as much with it in terms of the heat and the discomfort. I would say though, that this is not really, really typical of getting results for rosacea. She's an outstanding example of what is possible to achieve, um, but most people would have to come in more often uh, to have sort of regular top ups, but she did amazingly. So that was after five treatments. I used the Linton Lumina, so it's the 585 nanometer handpiece, and it was a combination of, obviously you patched us first as well, but over the course of five treatments, I used between a fluence of 22 and 30 with two pulses and 20 millisecond delay. So moving on to the next um, slide. Um, so to treat or not to treat. So if someone comes in to your clinic presenting like this, my advice would be do not put a laser on it at all or an IPL. Um, the first, so this is a classic example of papular pustular. In fact, it, it can look worse than this as well, but you can see the bumpiness on her skin. Now, the absolute key thing in this is to get the inflammation down. Um, and that can be with LEDs, uh, but it might require her to see a doctor or a dermatologist to be able to be prescribed medication to help with reducing that inflammation. And then only when, um, you know, it's sort of the skin is, is flat, um, then I would, I would try some um, laser on her. But it, again, anyone presenting with this can also present differently to this. So m my advice would be, don't, don't treat straight off. You'll have to literally see how it goes. So onto the next slide. So this gentleman uh, came in. So um, I have to say, because of the light in this, in this uh, uh, photograph, you cannot see just how dark his nose was. It, and it was just, it was incredible. I mean, it was so dark purple, it almost looked black. Um, and although you can obviously get, um, he obviously was getting and on the start of, of, of rhinophyma. Um, and, you know, when I know perfectly well that you're able to get noses that look obviously very dark purple, but it was the sheer depth of color that concerned me. 
plus he was a smoker um, and you know generally health wise wasn't you know it wasn't fantastic um, and so I referred him back to the doctor because I think you know it's it's never a bad thing to err on the side of caution and I just wanted to make absolutely sure that there was nothing else going on with him and as we all know <laughs> it's a massive generalization it's not always the case but men generally don't like going to see their doctors and so I think you know he really wanted to have some treatment it was a good it was a good opportunity and I remember his wife sort of nodding thinking yes that's a great idea but and he came back you know and I think it also instills confidence in people that you're not there just to you know do a treatment on them and, and take their money and run you are there for their best interests and so he came back from his doctor and that was fine so it's really important to know though that laser and IPL unless it's a CO2 laser is not going to correct um, a bulbous nose okay so once um, the, uh, you know, the, um, uh, the nasal tissue has started growing. Um, it's, you're not going to be able to correct that. Um, but what you can do is help stop the rhinophyma um, progressing quite as quickly, because when you have a lot of target like that on the nose, every time he was flushing and blushing, those vessels were obviously dilating and filling even more with blood. And so, those flushing and blushing episodes are basically going to um, increase the, the, the rhinophyma. So the nose is just gonna get uh, bigger and bigger. So what IPL and laser can do is it can definitely play a, play a big part if you catch it early enough to actually try and slow that process down. But if he was to develop a very large bulbous nose, then you do need a fully ablative CO2 laser, which is actually gonna reconstruct the nasal tissue. So, and onto the next uh, slide, you'll actually see um, his before and, and after. So after treatment, um, as you can see, I mean, you can see from the label, I actually took these photos in September, whereas he came into me, I think it was March. He did pick up a bit of color, a bit of sun um, over the, the summer after I treated him and after he'd stayed out of the sun for a full month minimum, as uh, I always tell people to do. So you can see on the nose where he's picked up a little bit of a tan, but as you can see, the vessels, I mean, the clearance is just staggering. I mean, he was absolutely delighted. I was absolutely delighted. And when you see results like this, as, as I'm sure you all know, watching as a practitioner, it just absolutely makes your day. So he was delighted and um, yeah, absolutely amazing. So, so yeah, really chuffed with that, but I think it was the right call to send him back to his doctor first, just because it was so, so dark. It was almost black, his nose. So, so the next slide is gonna show you basically just the before and after and I'm sorry about, sorry about the slight difference uh, in size of the photos, but I think you can see just what an impact uh, that laser treatment has made. So again, that's with my amazing 585 handpiece, which I love, um, and using a, a combination of, of energies anywhere between 22 and 28, two pulses, 20 millisecond delay, which is basically standard for vascular uh, treatments on this handpiece. So, so he was a happy chappy. So on to the next... Um, the next slide. Um, so, so basically, um, there is a little bit of myth busting that I would I would like to to do, um, and that is that there is no such thing as acne hyphen rosacea. Um, acne is a complication of the pilus sebaceous unit in the skin, and rosacea, as we've already discussed, is a progressive inflammatory vascular disorder. That is not to say you cannot have rosacea and acne, um, but it's more commonly mistaken. So it's it's definitely not the same condition. And years ago, it used to be called acne hyphen rosacea. People tend to be referring to the papular pustular one, but they are two completely different disorders um, that don't tend to be combined at the same time, um, but can be. So it's just something to look out for. Um, is rosacea caused by alcohol? No, it absolutely is not caused by alcohol, but it is exacerbated by alcohol, alcohol. And that is one of people's main triggers with rosacea. I mean, generally it's, you know, it's sun, alcohol, smoking, um, you know, incorrect skincare. These are all things that can really irritate and cause people's flare ups. Hormonal changes, you know, it can be 
you know, sometimes clients of mine say at certain times of the month uh, when their period is due, um, they know they're going to be struggling with their skin. And again, it, it's very difficult to say, you know, where that comes from, because when people are suffering with PMT, they're stressed, um, you know, um, and could that be actually the cause? It may not be the hormonal changes, but it may be the knock-on effect of hormonal changes that causes the stress and therefore causes the rosacea flare-ups. Um, is rosacea contagious? Absolutely not. It is not contagious at all. Um, so it looks, you know, it can look very inflamed and very angry, um, but it's not, it's definitely not con contagious. And also with rhinophyma, so um, you, it does affect women, definitely. I've definitely seen women, you know, even just in the street, on the high street, where I think, gosh, you know, she has rhinophyma. Um, but um, it tends to affect men more commonly. So, um, so on to the um, next slide. Um, so I've left a bit of time for questions. I'm conscious of time because I know we've been running over a little bit um, as well. Um, so that's just kind of like a quite an overview. As I say, it is quite a complex subject. And lots of little things I mentioned today are entire subjects in themselves. But the most the important thing that I hope that you will take away from this is to really approach this condition from a holistic uh, perspective and to really know the condition because I don't know about you but I hate it when I go somewhere for advice say I have a problem and I sit there and I suddenly think oh my goodness I think I actually know more about my problem than this person I'm actually going to seek advice from so you never want your clients to feel in that position so I would say if you are a laser clinic or you are treating with lasers to really get to grips with rosacea itself because you want to instill that confidence in people that you are the person who is going to be able to treat them effectively and help them so anyway right I should <laughs> I should be quiet now and allow for um uh, some questions. Thank you, Kerry. That was brilliant. That was so insightful and in-depth. Um, a few comments of people just saying thank you, and that was super, super interesting. Um, I'm just going to have a look if we've got any questions coming through from Facebook, but in the meantime, um, there are a few coming in on here. So someone said, thank you very much. That was so helpful. With LED, would you recommend near infrared, red or blue um, with the, the kind of, so near infrared 830, uh, red 633 or blue um, 4215? 415. They said 4215, but you're- I think it's a typo. That's okay. Yeah, yeah, blue, that's okay. So um, blue light, yeah, it's basically in sort of around 400s. Um, so again, it depends how they present. If it is, if it is very inflamed, okay, I would only put them under the near infrared because the red light is going to create a certain amount of stimulation as well. So I would only put them under the near infrared to, to start with. But if they are not really inflamed, there's a bit of inflammation, and you think this is someone who does have some acne as well as rosacea, obviously not the same thing, then yeah, you could have the blue light because the blue light is actually what kills uh, the anaerobic bacteria. So, um, so yeah, it, again, it, it's about knowing your wavelengths and, and seeing the person in front of you and kind of custom uh, customizing the treatment to, to how they're presenting. Okay, great, thank you. Um, mm, 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 mm. Lots of questions coming through now. Um, okay, uh, is there a good starter IPL for rosacea or skin condition? So this person saying they don't currently have a laser or IPL. So if they perhaps wanted to um, start specializing in treating rosacea, is there a good starter IPL that you'd recommend? So I don't believe in such thing as a starter in terms of is there like maybe a sort of smaller cheaper option yeah. I'm, I've only ever used the Linton Linton Lumina and it is hands down the most incredible piece of kit because the results like I've shown you you know on this webinar today my business wouldn't be where it is today if it wasn't for the equipment I use so I would say you know they do different ranges I mean I happen to have the all singing all dancing you know platform but they do have something called the XL light as well but I, I don't know a lot about that system but you are able to so for example, get a 585 hand piece, which treats your vascular, your acne, your pigmented lesions, all those kinds of things without necessarily buying a massive platform. But Linton is fantastic and it's won lots of awards. 
But the best thing as well is if you are new, as this person is sort of suggesting to, to Laser, is you absolutely want to go with a company who's going to have your back. And you need someone who's going to be there with exceptional training, um, you know, um, and uh, protocols and things that you can follow so that you're not just going somewhere who's people are just selling a machine and just, you know, leaving you to it. So, so yeah, I hope that helped. You know. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's, that's the most important element really, isn't it? I guess this, besides what equipment you decide to go for is making sure the training's top. Oh my goodness. When I, when I opened in 2005, I, I didn't actually, you know, take a wage for ages because I, I knew I was in it for the long haul and I wanted to invest in the best possible equipment. You know, if you're going to do laser treatments properly, this is not, something where you can make a fast buck you know you, you need because at the end of the day you're going to get unhappy clients they're going to come back and they're not going to get the results and so you know uh, it's just not not worth it um okay cool someone else has asked how do you find um ndag 1064 for treating blood vessels so with the ndag which i have in my clinic as well um I would really err on the side of caution when treating the face. Okay, so I use my NDAG for leg vessels, um, uh, and I, you can use it. I would go very, very low on the settings, but the NDAG is better suited to the vessels that are more sort of bluey. So that guy, for example, at the end of his nose where he has sort of purpley blue, yeah, the NDAG would get those, you know, brilliantly. But the YAG, that, so the higher you go up in nanometers, the deeper the penetration into the skin, which is why it's so suited for leg vessels, because leg vessels are deeper than the ones on your cheeks. Um, but I, I would choose, um, yeah, I would, I mean, I, I have an ND YAG as I have a KTP as well in my clinic, but I would use the 585 handpiece any day of the week on, on the face, so. Cool. Um... Okay, so you mentioned about identifying demodex mites yeah. um, and treating them. How do you identify them? And I'm so sorry if it seems too daft a question, but no, not not at all. <laughs> and absolutely, the only way to identify it is by actually having the biopsy. So um, you know, uh, it's not something I identify, but I think with experience, when someone comes in extremely inflamed. Um, you know and in a lot of discomfort there is a good chance they might we all have it anyway so it's it's not like do you have it or don't you, you we all have it it's whether that has gone into overdrive so i would say it's just a good thing to rule out even if you're you're not 100 sure you can't be 100 sure anyway but i would just rule it out uh, because you will know very quickly whether it is because the the redness and inflammation will go down so much um compared to what it was so Cool. Good advice. Um, uh, what type of sunblock would you recommend for rosacea cases? We've had a few questions about um, SPF actually. Yeah, so I so it's very important that when you when you are dealing with any kind of inflamed or sensitive skin, in particular rosacea, that you do only use mineral sunscreen. So obviously, chemical sunscreens um, can cause just more irritation, uh, more sensitivity. So um, in my clinic, I use two different types, um, and you know I use zinc oxide, which is a great physical block, um, but I would steer clear of chemical sunscreens. Okay. Would you mind just repeating the start again? It might just be me. You a Sorry. bit funny on my end. Oh, right. Um, so was there anything else apart from just steering clear? Was there anything else apart from? Apart from steering clear from chemical sunscreens. Um, yeah, just to make sure it's a mineral sunscreen. Uh, and so something like a zinc oxide um, is, I mean, there are other physical blocks, but yeah, make sure it's a physical block, not a chemical block, not a chemical sunscreen rather. Okay, cool. Um, and what about home care for rosacea? I'm sure that's something that will vary depending on, on your client, but is there like a general regime you'd put someone on for home care? 
Absolutely. So I often will ask people to come in with their skincare and sometimes people will arrive with a whole bag <laughs> of stuff, you know, that they've tried or are using. Um, so it's it's really important um, that you see what they're using at the moment, because it could be something that they're using in their current skincare that's causing, you know, their flare ups. So. Um, so, yeah, so I always get them on, um, take them off what they're using generally, because generally they're not using something that is that great for rosacea um, and then I get them onto I, I happen to use Jan Marini uh, in clinic I also use something called the Linton Light Soothe and sometimes it's a case of someone's really inflamed I just get them to come off everything and put them on on this product which happens to have hyaluronic um, acid in it and also uh, Manuka honey which is very soothing and gentle Okay, but cool. Sunscreen is key. They, the non-negotiable for me is they have to wear sunscreen. Yeah. So, yeah, as everyone should be anyway. Exactly. And, exactly. I mean, I, you know, I, I don't mind telling you I'm 47 this year, but I haven't put my face in the sun for 17 years. That's not to say I didn't in my 20s, but you, you live and learn. So, um, but yeah, sunscreen is key, and also because you know, 90% of the damage on our skin tends to occur between September and May. You know, UVA um, is, you know, goes straight through glass, you get it through your windscreen. Um, and that's another thing I say to rosacea, people don't think because you're in your car with your, you know, your window yeah, up, U UVB won't go through glass, but UVA does. Yeah. And so it's really important because we are constantly being um, assaulted by UV all year round, yeah. so. Yeah. Okay, um, someone's just asked, have you got any advice on where to go for further study on rosacea and kind of just best, how to achieve best patient outcomes, best practice with rosacea, that kind of thing. I know you mentioned, what was that website, rosacea.org that you mentioned earlier? Rosacea.org is brilliant. They will literally keep you abreast of, you know, um, the latest developments. Um, obviously there's another huge thing going on about how your gut can be related to all manner of things in the body and especially your skin and even possibly rosacea. Um, so they will keep you up to date with the latest things to, to know. Um, but in terms of uh, treatment, it, it depends what you, how you're set up. Obviously, if you're if you're thinking about doing laser, then again, if you're getting a system from a reputable company, then part of that um, sort of uh, purchasing the equipment will involve quite in-depth um, training on, on how to approach things like rosacea. Um, what I did, I mean, this was, you know, quite a few years ago, but I did um, a course on rosacea at the International Dermal Institute, which was fantastic. Uh, but I keep my knowledge up to date as well with, you know, reading articles from medical journals. I'm, I'm a geek, basically. <laughs> So for me, bedtime, I have a four-year-old, so, you know, Saturday nights for me is early in bed, probably reading a medical journal or something, uh, you know, boring like that to most people. But it's about, there's so much information out there. You know, when I started in 2005, God, you know, clients were coming to me from like yellow pages and, you know, it's a different world now. There's so much information out there. But equally, part of our role is to debunk myths when people come through the door, because unfortunately, although it's a fantastic thing that people are very informed these days, sometimes people can read all manner of stuff on the internet, which isn't actually true, but because it's written, therefore it is. And so, yeah. you know, part of our job is kind of debunking myths as well. So, um, so yeah, I hope that helps anyway. Um, what? else someone's asked which pha peels do you use in clinic so i don't actually use any pha peels um so uh i tend to use my uh glycolic uh peel and i also have a triacid peel uh which is really lovely and more gentle and can be used just before uh laser treatments but for me it's a case of people tend to be either i'm not going to treat them or I can get them to a stage where they can have very effective foliate exfoliation. But then again, it also depends, you know, if someone is, um, you know, very oily, for example, then you're not going to use X, Y, and Z. So it, you have to look at their skin as if it's just a skin assessment, let alone rosacea. So you can really tailor what you would use on, on that skin type. Hmm. What brand are, are your peels? Did you say, I know you said you use uh, Jan Marini. But yeah, they... so I use Jan Marini. Um, and I also use the Linton Triacid Peel, which is lovely okay, cool. as well. So, um, 
Okay, and then just some, a little something else about home care again. Would you recommend vitamin C antioxidant application in the morning for people with rosacea? So generally, you would always apply your vitamin C in the morning um, and your retinol at night. So that's just a general uh, skincare. With vitamin C, yes, in an ideal world, it'd be lovely to be able to get your rosacea clients to use vitamin C. But the first thing is to get them to a point where they can actually put various products onto their skin. And it again, it depends. So that lady I showed you the before and after picture where she had fantastic results, she was able to use pretty much everything. You know, she could use a 12% glycolic at home. It, those, you know, skin uh, care wasn't really a trigger for her. Mm -hmm. um, but other people, no, you know, other people might be better off starting off with something like azelaic acid, which is much more gentle, and then building up. But always, 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 they need to try just a small area of their skin, never just, you know, I mean, and they'll know because people who really struggle with inflammatory rosacea never want to put just stuff all over their skin anyway. So, um, so yeah, the, the thing is, is, is to start... Um, slowly and build up also because azelaic acid also has anti-inflammatory properties so that is something that uh, they can use as well cool good advice thank you um okay so two more questions how long would you recommend a client have led sessions for so a case is it a case of um a few months a few years keep having them for life I guess within the scope of if you're treating someone for rosacea and you're incorporating LED into that. Yeah. So um, that's a really tricky, it's kind of like how long is a piece of string? But yeah. basically, as as an you know, as a minimum, absolute minimum, I would say eight to twelve treatments. And ideally they need to be having them two to three times a week. And it depends how you know sort of uh, badly they're presenting um but led is fantastic for all manner of other you know skin rejuvenation skin issues so it's something they could have ongoing if they want to and if their budget uh, permits but the the most important thing is to make sure that you know if you are in a clinic that there is consistent um sort of uh, notes from appointments if they are seeing someone different each time that there is that um, sort of follow on so people can monitor how they're responding to treatment. Uh, in my clinic, we tend to try and stick with the same, you know, clients. So we have that continuity. But I would say definitely a course of at least eight to 12 and then monitor it. Um, ideally, I would get them to come in sort of once a month for a top up mm -hmm. um, if, if they can. But again, it kind of a lot of it is dictated by budget as well. So, yeah, of course. Um, okay, so I think just one more question. Uh, so when you're using IPR to treat, would the treated blood vessels return after a while? Um, I know you said with the, um, I can't remember, was it the man in the case study where you said they actually didn't, didn't really come back or one of the women you showed earlier on? Yeah, so she didn't have rosacea, she just had broken vessels. Yeah. I mean you, you can't, so they're not going to come back as in it's the exact same vessel, okay, because once you've coagulated that blood and the body's, you know, carried it away, it's not going to be that exact same vessel, but you can't stop the body, obviously, it's just part of the aging process, we are going to get broken uh, capillaries, um, so um, it is an ongoing, for, for, for someone like the lady who didn't come back, she was very outdoorsy, she's been wearing her sunscreen, um, yeah, you know, you might not see people for years, other people might come back uh, very quickly, but with rosacea, it's important to establish with that uh, client or patient that it is going to be an ongoing, so, but in an ideal world, they would have a course of treatment, they have to be managing it at home, you have to empower them and let them know what they can be doing as well to help the situation, and then just monitor it and make sure that they know that they can come back in if they start feeling like they're having flare-ups. Okay. Um, we just had one more question. Are you all right for time, Kerry? If I just yeah, ask absolutely. One more. Yep. Cool. Um, no, someone's just asked after having laser for rosacea, if the treatment's successful, what's maintenance like? So maintenance would basically be uh, what you're doing at home in terms of skincare and managing your triggers, which is absolutely key. Um, and coming in, if they feel like they're having an episode of flare ups or they're suddenly presenting with some new vessels, um, then that would be a time to come in. So unless it is the papular postular type, unless it's the very inflamed one, 
if they are having a flare up, people often will say, oh my goodness, I'm due in today, but I, I don't think I better come in. I'm, I'm having a big flare up. Well, actually that is exactly the time to come in because when the vessels are dilated, you've got, you've got the target so easily absorbed by the laser. So obviously you have to be careful with pre-cooling and things like that. But unless it's not, in, as long as it's not inflamed, the best time to come in is when the vessels are dilated because then you get the maximum absorption uh, by them. So what you don't want is to be applying anything that constricts vessels when you're gonna be having a laser or IPL treatment. Okay, cool. Um, oh, they just keep coming in. I keep saying one more, one more. Um, <laughs> someone's just asked, what do you think about thermocoagulation treatments? So um, the principle behind any of these types of treatments is to get the blood to coagulate. Okay, so I know, for example, years ago, someone came to me and she'd had some electrolysis treatments. So the idea there being using an electrical current to uh, coagulate the blood. I think there are better ways than things like electrolysis because the problem, so with this particular girl who came in, um, she was literally less, instead of having red veins, she now had brown veins. And it's the iron component in the blood that basically oxidizes that can cause this. But whereas an IPL, we get the blood to stick together, um, this just left her with, with brown. And once they went brown, there was basically not much I could do about it. So I think things like electrolysis is a cheaper option, but I don't think it's the best. And I have seen amazing results. You know, when sometimes people get spider nevi, um, you get one. I've seen, you know, people say, you know, they inserted a, a needle there and it just disappeared, great. Other times I've seen it, it's actually popped it and made it even bigger. Mm -hmm. So personally, I would always use a laser or, or IPL. Okay, Fab, that actually is the last question. And um, Kerry, that's been so good. We've had so many comments from people saying thank you. That's been super oh, helpful, that's really informative. <laughs> um, someone said, can we have something like this for Kerry again? Yes, we can. I'd love to have you back. Um, and also just for people asking about more um, kind of rosacea based stuff in general um, I'm sure we can have Kerry write something either for AMPB or both so um, if there's anything specific anyone would like to know um, within the realm of rosacea just let us know and I'm sure we can ask Kerry to do something a bit more specific if you'd like to Kerry. Yeah um, absolutely I would, I would love to do that I'm also on Instagram I, I try and post. What's your, what's your handle so people can it's, um, it? it's Laser Skin Solutions UK so um, but yeah I love I, I just I'm absolutely passionate about our whole industry and I think it's so nice that we have a whole community out there who are so wanting to learn more I mean I, I still learn stuff you know every day all the time and that's the nice thing about this it's not static it's constantly evolving and this whole thing now about you know your gut and the uh the impact on on skin is just I think it's going to be huge um yeah. yeah it's just it's really exciting so yeah well um yeah thank you again and thank no, you everyone thank for watching this will be so this has been streaming live to both the aesthetic medicine and the professional beauty facebook pages um and the videos will stay on there so if anyone wants to watch back um kerry i will send a copy of this to you oh that's fantastic um, and hopefully we'll all be able to open soon as well yeah. so god well that was something else we wanted to talk about i'm scared my laptop's gonna die um but just quickly, I mean, you said to me earlier that you are going to go ahead and open on the fourth. So in, initially last night, I was thinking I, I didn't put myself in the same category as beauty clinics only because of the treatments I do and don't do. Um, but I've been up a lot last night reading, I said, long story short, um, I'm going to wait and see what the BMLA has to say and the JCCP, which is the Joint Cosmetic uh, Council for Practitioners. I'm very lucky because obviously I, I have uh, lots of Linton laser equipment and John Exley, our, the MD, is on the BMLA panel. So I'm waiting to see what he's going to say and what the, the, um, uh, the British Medical Laser Association will say. My feeling at the moment is we might not be able to, even though I am set up like some COVID hospital ward now. Because um, I think um, aesthetic clinics and salon and beauty salons, you know, are used to having hygiene and health and safety measures in place. And what I think out of all business, 
businesses would adapt really well to having to have absolutely. enhanced procedures so it does seem a bit mad really absolutely I mean I I used to be regulated by the Care Quality Commission so we have infection control and decontamination procedures in place as standard we just had to tweak them and you know for for Covid but it is absolutely mad and you know what's so sad Georgia is that out of all the industry sectors, I think ours is one where people are dying to come back and get their hair done and get their, you know, so actually, and we need this, we need to get back on track because the economy is just, it's just going to be a nightmare otherwise. Yeah. So hopefully it won't be too long, but as I say, I'm waiting for further guidance, basically. Yeah, yeah, that's probably wise. Um, right, okay, well, I will let you go. Thank you again, everyone, oh. so much for watching. Um, we will be back with another session next week. Um, and thank you, Kerry. Have a oh, no, thank you. Thanks so much for having me. No worries. All, All right. right, have a good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, bye. Bye. bye.